So you are in touch with Nyaneshwar? Yes. So he is my friend. So he's very close friend. <laughs> yeah. So we are still close by or something? Uh, so it's like five hours train from like train like yeah from here but uh yeah we are in touch every day uh so it's like he like he was in born uh for his phd when i was also doing my phd yeah, yeah so we know each other since uh 2018 <laughs> yeah and also i'm a pharmacist so so yeah. you know <laughs> so, so, yeah. well, just looking at your profile so you are from great saturday this mess huh? Yeah, yeah, B.I.T. Mesra, yeah. So, your postdoc work is about fellowship, how uh, much more period? Uh, it was for one year, two months, and then I am now working with Springer, okay. Springer Nature, yeah. So, I'm working in the publishing performance and intelligent group uh, there as an editor. <laughs> so, I changed my job, yeah. But in Germany itself? Yeah, in Germany itself. So my workplace is in Heidelberg and I'm living in Dusseldorf at the moment. Yeah. Hello, am I audible to all? Yes. Sir. Yes. Okay. Good morning, one and all. Sorry, good afternoon, one and all. I, Ms. Ankita Shinde, Assistant Professor, Department of Pharmaceutics, TPU Pharmacy, Pimpri Pune, feel privileged to welcome you all on behalf of DPU Pharmacy for the eighth session of third International Faculty Development Program on Emerging Trends in Phytopharmaceutical Research. In the last week, we had a seventh scientific session on 13th May 2023. It was delivered by Dr. Manoj Upadhyay, Postdoctoral Research Associate, Neuroscience and Pharmacy Department, School of Life and Health Science, Aston University, Birmingham, UK. He provided information about the autoimmune epilepsy, rodent models, and osmotic pump implants, its processes and advantages. He also explained about transmitter implants for EEG recordings and various models for epilepsy. He also elaborated on NMDAR antibody model for its interpretation. Today we have with us uh, Dr. Pranav Joshi, uh, Institute of Physical Biology, Hendrich Hein University, uh, University of Germany. He would be delivering a session on the topic, Therapeutic Potential of Polyphenols in Alzheimer's Disease. Now I request Dr. Asha Thomas, ma'am, to please introduce our today's speaker. Please, ma'am. Thank you, Ankita, and a warm good morning to all. Ankita, I'm audible? Yes, yes, ma'am. So, a warm good morning to everybody. I'm extremely glad to introduce our speaker for the eighth session of this international FPP program, Dr. Pranav Joshi. Dr. Pranav Joshi has completed his undergraduate program in pharmacy from Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Science, and then his master's in pharmacy with specialization in pharmacology from Birla Institute of Technology, Mesra. He then worked as a research assistant at IICT Hyderabad for a period of three years. Dr. Pranav then moved to Germany to complete his doctoral program in molecular biomedicine with specialization in Alzheimer's disease at the Department of Neurology, University Hospital Bonn, Germany. Currently, he is working as a postdoctoral scientist at Heinrich Hein University, Germany. And as he just mentioned, he has currently joined Springer Science. Dr. Pranav has published several international peer reviewed research and review papers, book chapters, and has been awarded with prestigious research and travel awards. Apart from his academic career, Dr. Pranav has also volunteered as a young ambassador for the BAG, that is a German academic exchange program, which is the world's largest funding organization for international exchange of students and researchers. He's also the ambassador for the Federation of European Neuroscience Society. Recently, he has received recognition as a fellow of the Royal Microscopical Society and is also elected as a member of the Royal Society of Biology. With this very brief introduction on behalf of DPU Pharmacy, we welcome you, Dr. Pranav, to this IIT program. And I now request Dr. Pranav to deliver his session on 
therapeutic potentials of polyphenols in Alzheimer's disease. Over to you, Dr. Pranam. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Thomas, for introducing me. Maybe I share my screen. One thing. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right. Okay. Just a second. <clears throat> okay. So I'll start. So Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Thomas, once again, for introducing me. Uh, I would like, like again also to thank Dr. Thomas and other members of the organizing committee uh, of International Faculty Development Program uh, 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 of the Dr. D.Y. Patil Institute of Pharmaceutical Science and Research for inviting me to deliver this talk on phytopharmaceutical research. So today I would like to talk on the therapeutic potential of polyphenols in Alzheimer's disease. So to begin with, Alzheimer's disease is, as you can see here, is a most common form of dementia in elderly. It is characterized by widespread brain atrophy with a combined presence of two neuropathological hallmarks, the Alzheimer's A-beta plaques, and also intracellular deposition of neurofibrillary tangles in the brain. This accumulation causes the neuronal loss and is also often paralleled by the glial response, the microgliosis and the astrogliosis. In addition to this, the granulovacular degeneration and also the cerebral amyloid angiopathy is also common. So as you can see in this photo, the deposition of amyloid beta plaques precedes the neurofibrillary and neuritic changes with apparent origin in the frontal and the temporal lobe, the hippocampus and the limbic system. Now, it's a question time. I would like to ask you a question. So just raise your hands if you know the answer. I will wait for five seconds. Uh, and if I don't receive any answer from you, I will just continue as it is uh, because I need to keep this session running. So my question is, do you know who was the first case of Alzheimer's disease and who diagnosed it? So your five seconds starts now. Okay, so I don't see anyone raising the hands. So maybe I try to answer. Alzheimer was first presented in, 19, uh, in a 51 year old female patient named August Dieter in Frankfurt here in Germany in 1901. So in, two, in 1906, the clinical, clinical psychiatrist and neuroanatomist uh, Alois Alzheimer reported this as a peculiar severe disease of cort uh, cerebral cortex. And it was renamed after that as Alzheimer's disease. Now, the culprit of Alzheimer's disease is the abnormalities in the proteolytic processing of amyloid precursor protein expressed by the neurons. So in amyloidogenic pathway, the beta secretase cleaves the transmembrane APP domains in which in turn expose the beta CTF to the gamma secretase. This gamma secretase first cuts and releases the AICT into the cytosol. This is APP intracellular domain. And then releasing this, then this gamma secretase chops off the C-terminal region of this beta CTF to release a beta peptide into the, into the luminol. And this a beta peptide then further aggregates to form a beta plaques that we see in the brain. The amyloid formation is characterized by the initial lag phase in which the monomeric species nucleate and form oligomeric species, uh, followed by a growth phase of the fibril formation, which occurs to the elongation, as you see here, and also several other secondary events, such as fragmentation, secondary nucleation. Uh, and this plateau is reached when the amyloid formation is in its steady state, and there are no free oligomers that are available for further fibril formation. Now, I have one more question to ask. Do you know any different types of A-beta peptides? So you have five seconds to raise your hands. Okay, so I answer, I will answer that. <laughs> so the short answer is A-beta 1 to 40, uh, as they are the most abundant forms, like it, it is like uh, 80 to 90% of it and followed by 1 to 42 A-beta, which are around 5 to 10% of it. A-beta 42 
peptides are more hydrophobic and hydro and, and fibrinogenic and are principal species that are deposited in the uh, in the brain but i must say here is that it's a very complex uh, it's a very complex mechanism as the heterogeneity in the proteolytic cleavage by this gamma secretase and also the presence of several enzymes intracellularly as well as extracellularly leads to a uh, like a uh, like pool of a beta that are of various lengths and also they are post translationally modified so i would say it's beyond the scope of this today's talk but now let's have a look on the hamolard hypothesis so this hypothesis represents a classic theory of origins of both the familial alzheimer disease which are caused by mutation in amyloid precursor protein or the gamma secretase component presilin 1 or presilin 2 while the sporadic alzheimer disease cases are caused by combination of several genetic and then environmental risk factors ultimately it leads to the formation of altered a beta peptides so this hypothesis have been modified over years when it became clear that the correlation between amyloid a beta oligomers and also its deposit uh, and it's 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 not linear so the theory now suggests that the synaptotoxicity and the neurotoxicity may be mediated by such soluble form of a beta oligomers can also deposit in the brain in the form of diffuse diffuse plaques as you can see in the image on the right the dynamic nature of this a beta oligomers and the poorly defined mechanism of toxicity uh, uh, of make this topic bit controversial in the field the term aggregate stress here defines any me potential mechanism that may lead to the a beta aggregation either the a beta oligomers or the diffuse plaques this leads to the chain of event which can lead to the microglial and astrocytic activation and inflammatory response followed by altered kinase and phosphatase activities leading to hyperphosphorylation of tau resulting in the neurofibrillate angles as you can see here on the image on the left which then cause the neuronal dysfunction and death followed by dementia here you can see that these are the coronal brain section of mouse two mouse models of alzheimer disease the first model is the phyxafidi mouse model these are caused uh, these are produced by mu three mutation in the app that is swedish florida and london mutation in the app and the two mutation in the ps1 gene the another mouse model is the app mouse model app ps1 mouse model uh, like formed by swedish mutation in the app and P, uh, l166p mutation in the ps1 gene so these two mouse models are mostly used to study alzheimer disease pathology and they exhibit a beta deposition starting at the age of 3 months these are the confocal images uh, of the coronal brain sections uh, of the two models showing the a beta plaque stained by a beta specific antibody so the aggregated fibrillary a beta uh, can accumulate in the form of a beta plaques as you see here affects the adjacent or the, uh, the neurons or the non neuronal cells that are present in the vicinity of the plaques so the boxes here are the three different brain region this is the dentate gyrus region of the hippocampus this is the somatosensory cortex as well as this this is the retrospinal cortex so i have one more question to ask so it's a question time do you know how many animal models are currently used to study alzheimer disease five seconds to go okay i don't see anyone raising the hands so let me answer so there are around 168 animal uh, models that are uh, present in addition to the interver uh, intervertebrate and the non mammalian models most of these are the transgenic mice that over express the human genes involved in the production of als a beta plaques as well as also the neurofibrillary tangles the first animal model that was developed back in 19, 19 1995 so it was around 27 years ago the plaques that you see here are were first confirmed in 1985 and then in 1989 it was confirmed that this plaque consi consists of amyloid beta so as you see there was a huge time gap between the first reported case of alzheimer disease that is 1906 to actually confirming the pathology of a beta and tau per se so 
all this development in the field of Alzheimer's disease research is only within last two decades. So one more question. Do you know why human APP isoforms are used to generate transgenic mouse model? Five seconds to go. Okay, let me answer. So um, it is because this mouse APP itself is not sufficient enough to produce A beta plaques. So as you see here, uh, like such in a, in, a, in, a, in a very large amount. So also, even if you knock in this APP, human mouse murine APP into mouse once again, it might get some plaques, but potentially no tau pathology. So as you saw from my previous slide, this presence of A beta plaque as well as the tau, they both are responsible uh, and to be considered as the Alzheimer's disease. So the insertion of this human APP to generate the transgenic mouse model showed around 200 fold increase in the A beta plaque production, including the tau pathology. So several models are also generated afterwards that specifically used to study tau or A beta pathology, including specific mutation in the APP or PS1 or both. Now let's focus on the mechanisms involved in Alzheimer's disease. So here you can see in the schematic, the role of amyloidogenic processing of APP induced by genetic factors or aging that lead to the formation of A beta oligomers and also the extracellular A beta plaques. The small A beta aggregate contribute to the reactive oxygen species and also mitochondrial dysfunction. The formation of tau and neurofibrillate angle is also one of the mechanism that is also involved here. So in addition, the astrocyte as well as the microglia that are present in the vicinity of this neuron release cytokines, the reactive oxygen species, and also the nitric oxide. And this can also contribute to the neuronal oxidative stress as well as the mitochondrial dysfunction. The neuroinflammation is uh, responsible for abnormal secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines and trigger the detrimental signaling pathways leading to, this, uh, leading to the protein aggregation in Alzheimer's disease brain. So mitochondrial damage caused by this neuroinflammatory milieu from several uh, conditions uh, and also by aging or metabolic disorders such as type 2 diabetes mellitus and obesity induces the accumulation of free radicals and impairs the energetic efficiency of the neuron. So as you can see, the red boxes here are the main pathologic mechanism thought to be involved in Alzheimer's disease. So as you might have already realized, it's, it's, it is complex. Again, the question time. Do you know different drugs that are used in the clinical practice of Alzheimer's disease? You have five seconds to go. Okay, so let's go to the next slide to answer this question. So here are the FDA approved drugs. They are ACE inhibitors, as many of you know. It includes rivastigmine, galantamine, donepezil, and the NMD receptor antagonist that includes memantine. So these are the drugs that are used in the clinical practice for mild to severe dementia and provide a symptomatic relief, elevating some of, some of the extent of the Alzheimer's disease or the cognitive dysfunction. So despite useful in improving the quality of life of a patient, they are not able to interrupt or delay the Alzheimer's disease progression. So I would say we still need to look for more effective disease modif modifying agents. So currently here in this schematic, you can see that there are around 143 drugs in the current Alzheimer's disease drug development pipeline at various stages of clinical trials. As you can see here, phase one, phase two, and phase three, and they belong, this drug belong to four major classes, the disease modifying biologic, disease modifying small molecules, neuropsychiatric uh, symptom modulator, and cognitive enhancers. So these disease modifying therapies represent around 83% to 85% of the candidate treatment. The great emphasis has been given uh, nowadays on non-pharmacological non interventions to prevent or reduce Alzheimer's disease severity. Many observational studies in Alzheimer's disease mouse model, as well as in human patients, have evidence that this lifestyle interventions, including physical exercise, uh, then caloric restrictions or nutritional supplements with antioxidant compound are effective in reducing 
uh, the Alzheimer disc uh, risk factor uh, in to us to some extent. So among such nu nutritional supplement uh, or the antioxidant compound, the polyphenols are the focus of my talk. The term polyphenol is derived from an ancient Greek word mean, polis that means many or much, and the word phenol which refers to the chemical structure formed by attaching to an aromatic benzenoid ring to a hydroxyl group as you see in the alcohols. So the term polyphenol is not well defined, but is generally accurate that they are natural products having polyphenol structure, including four major classes that are phenolic acids, flavonoids, steel beans, and lignans. So let's look into, some, uh, into more details of some of the polyphenols as a disease modifiers of Alzheimer's disease. The first thing, uh, first is the resveratrol. It's a polyphenol typically found in the skin of the grapes. I have summarized here uh, the important findings that I saw, uh, that I observed about each compounds that we will be discussing in relation to its role in Alzheimer's disease pathology. So this resveratrol has shown to have anti-inflammatory, antioxidant and anti-diabetic effect it inhibits the activity of beta secretase to modulate A beta clearance. It also improves the cognition, reduces A beta plaque formation, inhibits the microglial activation in APPPS1 mice. It decreases the amount of insoluble A beta. Insoluble a form of A beta means the A beta that is uh, responsible for forming A beta plaques. So, just to uh, simplify this. And it also inhibits the A beta aggregation. Uh, from lower molecular weight oligomers to higher molecular weight agreement oligomers and disrupt the pre from A beta aggregates. So in a clinical trial, the treatment with resveratrol of patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease induce a decrease of A beta levels in cerebrospinal fluid and a reduction of neuroinflammatory biomarker. However, I must say here that the pilot study uh, carried out on elderly patients has revealed that this chronic use of resveratrol selectively improves the psychomotor speed without significant effect on the memory function. So this is, this is something like a contradictory result, right? So we could extract this result, maybe connected to the poor penetration of the resveratrol through the blood brain barrier, or also maybe it's low overall bioavailability. Therefore, formulation of resveratrol with improved bioavailability could increase its efficacy. Recently, uh, there was a paper published where they show that this nano encapsulation in a lipid carriers or the liposomes, as well as insertion into polymeric particles could ameliorate both pharmacodynamics and the pharmacokinetics of resveratrol. The second polyphenol is epigallocatechin gallate, also known as EGCG. So it's a main polyphenolic constituent of the tea plant and is considered to be a major constituent of beneficial effect of green tea. So the key studies have found out that this EGCG can interfere with A-beta aggregation. It can bind quickly and also in a non-specific manner to the A-beta monomers while it displays higher affinity towards oligomers. Electron microscopy study have shown that this EGCG can inhibit the A-beta secondary nucleation. And in a transgenic mice, this it's another mouse model. As I said, it's 168 mouse model total. So it's one of the mouse model. It's uh, with uh, just the mutation in the APP gene. So in this mouse model, the intraperitoneal treatment with EGCG for two months is associated with a significant reduction in the A-beta level. The next thing is that it has also uh, displayed a neuroprotective and anti-inflammatory activity in several studies by reducing TNF alpha, interleukin 1 beta, interleukin 6, and INOS levels. The last point is that this EGCG exert a positive effect on the cognitive function by promoting reactive oxygen uh, species, scavenging and counteracting the A-beta-induced mitochondrial apoptotic processes. Now, this EG EGCG treatment displays some limitations as it has a high rate of metabolism and subsequent degradation. Uh, which in turn prevent the sufficient concentration in the human plasma. It also, uh, I would say, on the other hand, displays to permeable blood brain barrier at a very low micromolar level. The next compound is curcumin. As many of you know, it's a polyphenol extracted from rhizomes of curcuma longa lin, and it's, it possesses a variety of pharmacological properties. So there are studies 
that explains that the uh, that this curcumin improves the cognitive functions in Alzheimer's disease by reducing oxidative damage, inflammation, and Alzheimer's disease and A beta aggregation. It inhibits the formation of A beta 40 as well as A beta 42 fibrils in vitro in a dose dependent manner and destabilizes preformed fibrils. It binds to the monomeric species and, and, and also the low molecular weight oligomers to induce major structural changes in A beta 42 aggregate. It can also intercalate among A beta chains in the first stage of aggregation to, to form hydrogen bonding and the hydrophobic interaction with the A beta peptide, leading to more disordered amyloid structure. And this, once they are formed, they are not stable anymore. So it's easily disintegrated and they are uh, removed by the microglia in the brain. So basically, this curcumin is kind of responsible for uh, uh, you know, disintegrating the formed A beta fibrils. The last thing is that the systemic treatment with curcumin reduces the pre existing plaques in eight to eight months old APP Pearson mice, suggesting its ability to disintegrate into A beta deposits. So, there are studies that explain the poor availability, uh, ability of the curcumin to pass through blood brain barrier and it's very low by oral bioavailability. Therefore, in last year, many curcumin analogs, analogs with improved aqueous solubility, pharmacokinetics, bioavailability, and stability have been synthesized. So meanwhile, there are also some strategies, as I mentioned before, uh, to improve the delivery of the curcumin into the brain. So in, put, in particular, curcumin containing nanoliposomes, as well as the other delivery system have been designed and, and, and also show very effective in reducing A-beta fibrils. So importantly, these compounds uh, show much greater efficacy than curcumin itself, hence appearing as a promising agents for Alzheimer's disease treatment. The fourth polyphenol is genistein. Genistein is a naturally occurring isoflavone, mainly found in soybean, green peas, legumes, and peanuts. Uh, mechanistically, genstein potentially inhibits the activity of tyrosine protein kinase and also DNA topoisomerase. So the presence of numerous polyphenolic moieties uh, in its structure exerts a potent antioxidant effects. It modulates several pathogenic mechanisms in Alzheimer's disease, including A-beta metabolism, inflammation, and cholinergic system dysfunction. It can also reduce the production of A-beta by inhibiting the base. Base one, this is the key enzyme that is responsible for forming a beta peptide. Then it also reduces the neurotoxicity induced by a beta 1 to 42 by inhibiting the kinesing AP1 ATT or RAS homolog family receptor member A and therefore a beta accumulation. So can anyone tell what is this? Uh, what are these uh, enzymes? Five seconds to go. Okay, so these are the uh, these are the key regulators of endocytic pathway. And the studies have shown that uh, they regulate endocytosis of A-beta uh, leading to the neurotoxicity as well as uh, the intracellular accumulation of A-beta. So it could be either in the neuron or also in other cell type. So they are very important modulators of endocytosis in, in, uh, to cut short. And then the last point is that treating astrocyte with genstein modulates increased levels of interleukin 1 beta and tumor necrosis factor alpha induced by a beta. So the fifth one is quercetin. Quercetin is a ubiquitinous uh, flavonoid widely distributed in fruits and vegetables. It has bound to exert a strong anti-aggregating anti and anti-inflammatory activities. So it inhibits the a beta aggregation by destabilizing oligomeric species of misfolded protein and inhibiting the fibril growth. It acts as an anti-inflammatory anti activity underlying its positive effect on cognitive function in APPPS1 mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. It reduces A-beta plaques and also tau phosphorylation. And this tau phosphorylation is responsible for formation of uh, neurofibril tangles that we see in Alzheimer's disease. It decreases the amount of extracellular A-beta improves the astrogliosis and microgliosis and preserves cognitive function in triple transgenic mouse model. So this is another mouse model in Alzheimer's disease where uh, there are 
three times mutation in just the in the APP uh, in the amyloid precursor protein gene. So not in the gamma secretase come or not in the PS1 gene. Then it also acts as a scavenger for reactive oxygen species or reactive nitrogen species to increase the expression of superoxide dismutase, the sort, or glutathione, this GSS, and is positively modulate NRF2 signaling. I would say, despite this promising uh, therapeutic potential, the clinical approach uh, with the use of quercetin has been quite limited, again, due to its poor permeability to the blood-brain barrier, low bioavailability, and rapid metabolism. However, several studies using multiple nanoparticle formulation have significantly improved brain delivery of quercetin, and hence, uh, and also enhanced his, uh, its bioavailability. The sixth in the list is lutein. It's a flavone widely distributed in herbs and vegetables, and has emerged as an interesting phytochemical able to mitigate many pathologic mechanisms responsible for Alzheimer's disease. Lithionine exerts an anti-inflammatory effect. It suppresses the expression of pro-inflammatory and pro-apoptotic genes in a dose-dependent manner. It can improve the memory deficits in mouse model of Alzheimer's disease by inhibiting the astrocyte overactivation, neuroinflammation, and by reducing endoplasmic reticulum stress. Lutein also have also demonstrated to improve the cognitive abilities in mouse model of vascular dementia by modulating the expression of inflammation and also by stimulating neuro uh, neurogenesis. Combination of lutein with L-theanine amino acid uh, prevent the Alzheimer's disease-like symptom and by improving the hippocampal uh, insulin signaling, decreasing the neuroinflammation in, in this mouse model. So, lithium seems to be a modulator of human reaction of, and is very efficient anti-inflammatory properties uh, in, in peripheral macrophages uh, as in comparison to other uh, uh, polyphenols and also uh, its analog quercetin. So basically you see lithium is just the analog of quercetin with just change in the one hydroxyl group. Now I will present to you one interesting natural flavonoid with different biological functions under pathological circumstances. So that is the routine. It's also called rutocide, quercetin 3 or retinoside or sophorin, and is a glycoside uh, con combining the flavone quercetin uh, with the disaccharide retinose, as you see here. So it's, it's a citrus flavonoid found in variety of plants, including the citrus fruit. So among various pharmaceutical properties, routine exerts uh, antioxidative and anti-inflammatory activities in diabetes, obesity, and Alzheimer's disease. I want you all to see now how this drug is studied in the lab at preclinical stages to further investigate whether this could be a potential candidate for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. So to begin with, routine is poorly insoluble in water. Hence, it is limited its usage and biological activity. So in this study, the author processed this routine into a salt form uh, using alkaline aqueous solution, which has uh, greatly improved its water solubility by at least 200 fold. To further identify the physical chemical properties of sodium routine, uh, the HPLC and TLC was performed. According to this HPLC assay, the retention time of sodium routine was way ahead of the routine standard under the same mobile phase conditions, indicating that this uh, sodium routine form or the sodium form of routine has a higher uh, polarity as compared to this routine standard. And the TLC also confirmed this, uh, confirmed this higher polarity of sodium routine. Uh, in addition to this, the authors have also performed the proton NMR, carbon-13 NMR, uh, and then they found that the sodium salt of routine uh, maintains the integrated structure of routine, but also improves its water solubility and bioavailability. Next, to investigate the biological effect of sodium routine, they, the authors use APPPS on mouse model. So what they did, they administered orally the mice, starting at the age of, so they administer sodium routine orally, uh, starting at the age of six months to the age of 13 months, and at the age of 13, at 12 months, they assessed the behavior test. Uh, and this, what they checked was they assessed the, the spatial learning and memory of mice by using Morris water maze. 
So as many of you already know, this Morris water maze test consists of a water maze with a platform submerged into water, as you can see in this schematics, in one of the quadrant. So the time required for a mice to find a platform is called escape latency, as you can see here in the graph. And the Morris water maze consists of two paradigms. First is the training days or the training period and also the probe test. Here, the authors train the mice for six days consecutively. So as you can see in this graph, and during the probe trial, the platform will be removed and the target entries into the quadrant as well as the total time the animal spent in that particular quadrant will be assessed. So as you can see from these graphs, compared with the wild type mouse, as you see in the blue color here, dark blue color, as well as dark red color here, the Alzheimer disease mouse showed a significant spatial learning memory, uh, learning memory and deficits as, as reflected by longer escape, escape, uh, longer escape latency time, as well as uh, uh, during the trials, as well as the longer crossing number of the target entries, as well as a, a decreased amount of time that is spent in the target quadrant. However, you see on the other hand, the sodium treated group, sodium routine treated group significantly reverse this effect. And you see that it is quite similar to the wild type mouse. So you see there is overall increase in the target entries as well as the total time spent in the target quadrant. So here the swimming uh, speed or, or the velocity of the mice was not affected uh, in all the four groups. Uh, this means that all the mice that were used in the study were healthy and they were not affected by any treatment. The learn this learning and memory deficits are usually caused by impairment in synaptic plasticity, which is accompanied by the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Hence, uh, to investigate this, the author performed Golgi Cox training. So Golgi Cox training, as you can see here, this is a neuron and you see here are the spines. So dendritic spines. So basically authors compared different types of spines and they also calculated the total number of spines uh, in, in all the four groups. So here you see wild type APPPS1. You see there was overall reduction in the number of spines in the APPPS1 mice. This is of course due to the Alzheimer disease. And they also have this wild type with sodium routine as a control to the treatment. And here they have this APPPS1 mice treated with sodium routine. And here you see that there was significant increase in the uh, uh, increase in the uh, in the increase in the number of spines in the APPPS1 mice treated with sodium routine, as compared to the APPPS1 control mice. So together, these uh, results su suggest that the sodium routine treatment could reverse the synaptic dysfunction and ameliorate spatial learning and memory deficits in Alzheimer's disease mice. So. Next is that to assess whether this sodium routine affects the EBITDA plaque pathology, the brain sections were immunostained with EBITDA specific antibody and the amount of EBITDA plaques were quantified. As you can see here, so this is the immunostain, immunohistochemistry, chemistry, and these are the quantifications of the immunohistochemistry. chemistry. So here what they have, fo authors have focused is the prefrontal cortex, and this is the dentic gyrus region of the hippocampus. Again, they have four groups, wild type, APPPS1, wild type treated with sodium routine, and APPPS1 treated with sodium routine. As you can clearly see, in the APPPS1 mice, there are a lot of A-beta plaques as compared to wild type. This is obvious. And in a sodium routine treated uh, APPPS1 mice, there was a reduction in the number of plaques. So to further analyze which A-beta fractions were affected by sodium routines, the soluble and insoluble forms uh, were extracted from the prefrontal cortex followed by Western blot analysis. So as you can see here in this uh, Western blot results that the, uh, the, in the sodium treated group in APPPS on mice, the, uh, in the soluble A-beta was not changed, but the insoluble form of A-beta was decreased in the sodium routine treated group, uh, sodium uh, routine treated APPPS on mice. This means that the sodium routine treatment to the APPPS1 mice leads to the decrease in the uh, insoluble form of A-beta that is responsible for formation of plaques in the brain. But there was no effect on the soluble form of A-beta. Now, and this is exactly what they have quantified it here. So uh, there is no other explanation we need for it. Then 
to further uh, uh, analyze uh, you know what are the key factors that are involved in the ABTA production so they perform western blot analysis and quantified accordingly so here are the western blots and here you see the quantification of all the western blot they have done so as you can see here compared with the app ps1 mice so we just now focus on app ps1 mice and the app ps1 mice treated with sodium routine so this is also something like a control for us but for quantification, we just need to see where we see the A beta, right? So here, there was no significant change in the expression level of APP full length, then also the soluble APP beta alpha, then the CTF, both alpha and beta, and also the processing secretases, such as the beta site APP cleavage, cleaving enzyme, that is base, then the beta secretase complex, the nisquatin, then uh, the insulin, uh, presilinin enhancer 2, as well as presilinin 2. So as you can see, there was no change in all in, in both the mouse model, the APPPS1, as well as APPPS1 mouse model treated with sodium routine. So together, this finding demonstrated that uh, the sodium routine treatment alleviates a beta burden without altering the APP expression and processing in APPPS1 mice. Next, we know that uh, in chronic inflammation uh, is often accompanied by the abnormal, uh, uh, abnormal activation of estrocyte and microglia and is usually observed in patient in uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease as well as in mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. So what others have done is that they immunostained uh, the brain section with the glial fibrillary acidic protein, GFAP. It's a specific marker for estrocyte, as you can see here followed by quantification. So this is a quantification for the, Im the images here. So what you can see as expected, higher astrocytic activation was observed in the APPPS1 mice as compared to wild type mouse. And this is also true with dented gyrus region. But here you see that uh, in, just in the, in the dented gyrus region, there was no change in the, in the quantification. This is what it is represented, no significant change. But I must, we must say that we must understand that this dented gyrus region of the hippocampus is very small in the whole brain. So maybe uh, this results was, uh, was affected due to the limited sample and also maybe the limitation in the analysis what, of the results, what they have done. So that's why they extracted the brain lysates and then they access, assess the protein expression of this marker, GFAP. Uh, and you see again here, now very clearly that in APPPS1 mice treated with sodium routine, there was reduction in the GFAP level in the prefrontal cortex as well as also in the hippocampus. Next, the brain section were immunostained with ionized calcium binding adapter molecule, EBA1. It's also known as a specific marker for microglia in the brain to examine the extent of microgliosis. So, Overactive microglia were observed in APPPS1 mice. This is, of course, again expected because these microglia are responsible for covering the A-beta plaque, which, was, which we will anyway see later in the next slide. So they examine, over, uh, examine overall the microgliosis. So here you see that in APPPS1 mice, there was overactivation of microglia. But in sodium routine treated group of APPPS1 mice, there was decrease in this microgliosis. And this is, and, and of course, in both the brain region, the dented gyrus region, as well as the prefrontal cortex. And this is exactly what they have quantified here. Again, they check the expression of EBA1 in the lysates from both the brain regions. And you see again, that there was overall decrease in the expression of EBA1 in the PFC, as well as the hippocampus in the sodium routine treated group, uh, as compared to the PPPS1 control mice. So, these data now demonstrate that the sodium routine treatment significantly decreases the chronic neuroinflammation and associated, uh, uh, and associated changes that is microgliosis and astro, um, astrogliosis in Alzheimer's disease mouse. In the brain, the extracellular A beta is mainly phagocytosized and cleared by the microglia. So microglia are the key regulators to clear the A beta in the brain. So author performed the immunohistochemistry analysis using EBA1, that is a marker for microglia and A beta specific antibody, and then they co immunostained this. And uh, to check 
you know the number of microglia microglia that are recruited to the a beta plug so here you see in the quantification is that the appps1 mice treated with sodium routine there was overall increase in the uh, increase in the recruitment of my number of microglia per plug and also they also have compared the different size of plaque and also in this analysis they found out that irrespective of the plaque size the number of microglia that are being recruited to the plaque are more to elucidate whether this enhanced microglia recruitment around the plaques could facilitate a beta engulfment and clearance the authors immunostain co-immunostain the cd68 the e a beta and the eba1 again uh, and then the author quantified the CD68 microglial phagosomes, as you can see here, the phagosome percent area, and also internalized A beta percentage. So, what they found out is that the sodium routine treatment group, uh, like uh, treated to APPPS on mice, showed significant increase in the phagosome area, percent area, and also the internalized A beta percentage as compared to the APPPS on mice. So, now this both the studies suggest that this sodium routine treatment enhances the microglial a beta phagocytosis to further demonstrate that this sodium routine could enhance the microglial a beta phagocytosis microglia were isolated from the brain mouse brain for primary culture followed by uh, uh, treating this microglia with fitc labeled a beta that is fluorescent isotheocyanate labeled so it's usually green in color and for the uptake assess. So this, so as you can see from this quantification directly that the sodium treated uh, routine treatment group increased the capacity and efficiency of FITC labeled A beta uptake by the microglia. And over, over, over a period of time period of 24 hours, you also again see the similar effect. Here, the authors use the cyto, uh, cytochile uh, stellacin D, the cyto D uh, as an inhibitor of the actin filament that almost abolish the activity of microglia to phagocytosis this in, uh, FITC labeled A beta. So together, this result demonstrated that the sodium routine treatment enhances the microglial recruitment adjacent to the plaque and also improve uh, the microglial phagocytic capacity, thus promoting A beta clearance in Alzheimer's disease brain. Now to explore whether this sodium routine treatment enhanced microglial phagocytic capacity the author first isolated the, the CD45 low, CD11B positive cells as microglia from a control as well as the sodium routine treated APPPS and mice using FACS, that is the fluorescent activated cell sorting, and measured the expression levels of phagocytic receptors through the quantitative real time polymerase chain reaction, also known as RTQPCR, to examine mRNA level expression of putative microglial phagocytic receptors including triggering receptor micro, uh, of express on myeloid cells 2, the complement receptor 3, uh, then the G-protein coupled receptor 34, MER receptor tyrosine kinase, and also pyrimidinogenic receptor P2Y6. Since the phagocytic receptor are mainly expressed on the microglia, the expression of this receptor were normalized to EBA1, and they found out that uh, the receptor genes were significantly increased in the sodium routine treated group to the APPPS1 mice as compared to controlled APPPS1 mice. So also we can see from both these uh, images and as well as the quantification is that the expression of TREM2 uh, is also significantly increased in the activated plaque associated microglia in a sodium treated group, uh, uh, sodium routine treated APPPS1 mice as compared to the APPPS1 control mice. So next, Next question was whether to check uh, whether was to check whether the sodium routine regulates the energetic met energetic metabolism of microglia. Since we know this ATP is important for microglial phagocytosis and A beta clearance, the author first observed that this ATP production was significantly increased in the primary microglia treated with uh, A beta. They also found out that uh, they also found out just the treatment with sodium routine. Uh, even under the condition without a beta stress uh, is increased, indicating that the sodium routine could itself uh, enhance the energetic metabolism in microglia. 
we know that this uh, glycolysis and the tricarboxylic acid uh, coupling with oxphos this is oxidative phosphorylation are the two major pathways of atp production and to supply energy for the cellular function so to investigate how this sodium protein enhances microglial energetic metabolism they perform one interesting technique it's called seahors extracellular flux assays and they perf uh, and uh, in the and they perform on this microglia so this extracellular acidification rate also known as ecar reflects the glycolytic flux here you see here the glycolysis and the oxygen consumption rate ocr reflects the mitochondrial uh, uh, oxidative respiration so author found out that the ecr ecar was not affected as you see here but the ocr was significantly increased by uh, sodium routine treatment suggesting that the the, the increased microglial energetic metabolism of sodium uh, routine treatment was due to enhancement of microglial osphos uh, but not the glycolysis uh, because you see there was no difference here in uh, result okay so to re reveal the relationship between mitochondrial osphos and the microglia associated a beta phagocytosis authors use retinone and antimycin a to inhibit the oxfos and the galactose to promote the oxfos so these are some of the drug modulators that are used in such kind of mechanistic studies so these results you can see clearly see that that rote aa significantly reduce the microglial a beta uh, phagocytosis and the galactose pre treatment significantly enhance the microglial a beta uptake in the next essay and in also one of the last essay um, to determine how this sodium routine affects the microglial metabolism under pathological condition the lipopolysaccharide lps and in, uh, interleukin 4 was used to induce microglial polarization so this microglial polarization mean if you know just about a little bit about microglia there are different uh, types of microglia uh, based on their activation stage. So M1 microglia means the basic, the, the first stage of activation. M2 is the second stage. So uh, LPS stimulation can lead to transition from M1 microglia to the M2 microglia. So this is some, uh, that are some important key points about this microglia. So as you see here, upon LPS stimulation, you see that ECAR was significantly decreased while OCR were significantly increased, while you don't see any much difference in the uh, in the lipopolis LP4 stimulation. So this means that the microglia displayed uh, increased glycolysis with reduced microglial oxidative phosphorylation, which is like something like activated microglia in Alzheimer's disease. So together, these data demonstrated that the sodium routine enhances the energetic metabolism by improving mitochondrial oxfos. So these all findings suggest that this sodium routine itself can act as a metabolic switch from anaerobic glycolysis to the mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation under pathological condition, thus providing a sufficient energy for, for the microglia for A beta uptake and also by reduce for further reducing the A beta associated plaque pathology. So so these are the summarizing, uh, summarizing points of the, all the finding of the sodium routine study. So if you want to read more about it, please go and check this paper by Rui Yuan et al, published in Science Advances back in 2019. So as you saw from several experiments until now, the salt form of sodium routine was proved to be preclinically effective for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Now, to summarize this talk, uh, we can say that, that this polyphenol may serve as a therapeutic agent owing to their uh, antioxidant and anti-inflammatory activities, uh, which may be useful in, in, in counteracting the oxidative stress as well as neuroinflammation uh, per se in Alzheimer's disease. And these polyphenols uh, can also modulate, uh, as I said, uh, the A beta aggregation uh, and also accumulation by uh, accumulation of A beta by reducing the brain A beta burden and also by, uh, by confirming several biological effects uh, the polyphenols could be beneficial in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Also, we should not forget by uh, implementing this nanotechnology and synthetic strategies may improve their pharmacokinetic profile as well as therapeutic potential of these polyphenols in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. So with this, I would like to thank you all for your attention.
Uh, I thank again the members of organizing committee of International Faculty Development Program, Dr. D.Y. Patil Pharmacy, Institute of Pharmaceutical Science and Research. Uh, at last, but not the least, I must say thanks to all the researchers who have contributed to these important findings and breakthrough in the field of Alzheimer's disease research. Uh, if you are particularly interested in neuroscience and Alzheimer's disease, uh, here, are, here are the important resources that, would, that I would like to highlight here to, uh, uh, for you all. Uh, please take a note of it and check it if whenever you have time. Now I would like to take the questions. I know we are running out of time already. So uh, just in case if you, I'm unable to answer your questions or uh, I would say the questions that rather need a longer explanation, uh, then I would be happy to answer by mail. So write to me anytime and I would be happy to talk about science. Thank you very much. Hello, sir, yeah, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you, sir, for such a wonderful session. Uh, so we have one question in the chat box. Uh, ah, okay. Which are the preferred animal models to study anti-Alzheimer's activity? It's a very complex question. Uh, as I said, there are around 168 animal models and all these animal models serve different purpose. So, but I would say uh, generally widely accepted mouse models are this Phyx FAD mouse model and APPPS1 mouse model that I already presented. But uh, there are limitations to this model. So we must look out for the study like so which study we are doing and what is the ultimate uh, uh, objective of it for example if we do some behavior assess, uh, assessment then might be this spike cephid mouse model we see a beta plaque pathology at veda in those brain mouse uh, brains um, if you just compare for mouse as well as lifespan of a humans so we uh, in the humans, usually uh, we see the detectable amount of a beta plaque at the age of 80 years, roughly. But in mouse, in, we can, uh, in this mutated mice, we get in just three months. So uh, yes, I, I, there are some limitations to this mouse model. So they are really not realistic to really study the a beta plaque pathology, similar to the humans. But uh, maybe could address some of the questions related to a beta, uh, you know, plaque pathology associated uh, problems. So it's uh, it depends, you know, what kind of study we are doing. Uh, this is the answer, I think, more relevant. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, we have one more question in the chat box by Dr. Ashaman. Uh, what is the accuracy of behavioral models to predict efficacy in neurodegenerative diseases? Sorry. Uh, can you repeat? I, I, or maybe I can. Okay, sorry. Uh, what is the accuracy of behavioral mm -hmm. models to predict the efficacy in neurodegenerative diseases? Uh, efficacy of drugs, do you mean? Or efficacy of animal model itself? This I'm trying to understand. Because if you just think about efficacy of these models, uh, you know, as I said, they are really not realistic to the humans, right? So uh, it is just that we it helps us to uh, in the in the uh, to find a suitable treatment to treat the Alzheimer's disease. But if we think about efficacy of just uh, uh, the behavior tests, then they are fairly accurate, I would say, uh, because it's a neurodegeneration. It's not like psychiatry problems, because in psychiatry, uh, for example, depression or any other psychiatric symptoms or problems, it's really hard to uh, distinguish or it's hard to interpret what we get at the end from this uh, uh, behavior test. But in the neurodegeneration or also some induced mouse model, for example, uh, uh, some treatment or something like a stroke. So where we do the surgery to the mouse, so what we see at the end, behavior, uh, a behavior really is likely to be expected uh, from those mouse models. So yeah, this is it from my side. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's one more question. How uh, to notice the very beginning of the disease? Very big. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's difficult. Uh, it's really, really difficult. So 
Um, I mean, we, I mean, when I was doing my PhD, I used to also ask the same question to my guide. Like, how do we really like uh, uh, recognize, I mean, find this, uh, that whether we will be having Alzheimer at the age of maybe 70 years, right? So it's really hard. We don't know the answer. We don't know the answer. So basically, we just know that this a beta, uh, the a -B Alzheimer's is caused by uh, a beta plaques or a beta or then the tau or like death of neurons and so many other things. But then when, but then there are some studies like meta-analysis and like, you know, several clinical studies where they have shown that this deposition of a beta in the brain start at the age of, let's say, like between 35 to 40 years of age of a human, of a uh, like your human being and to find like detectable a beta plug is usually at the age of 80 so and once you have this a beta plug at the age of 80 then you start getting this problem like dementia and so many other things but to to get this dementia and other things the deposition already started at the age of 35 years and this is the, also the problem in the therapeutic planning of or therapy of the Alzheimer's disease. We don't know the time point. So I have no idea if I will get Alzheimer's at the age of 60 or at the age of 80. Uh, so this is one of the limitations. So, but now there was a, there was a monoclonal antibody recently that was, uh, that is in the phase three clinical trial that they uh, want to give to people at the age of, I think, 40 once a year and again we don't know the dose let's say like once a year we need to take or once a month or once a day so this is also not clear so to be really honest it's very hard to uh, tell at what time point but what generally people like in the clinical practice do is that they do this pet scanning or mri scanning but again at the end stage right so not at the very early stage like at the age of 25 or at the age of 30 it's not possible so it's very complex. It's, it's way beyond what we are thinking about. <laughs> so that's why these animal models are being used uh, uh, for several, uh, uh, to study different, this different disease pathology. And just imagine like, why there was a need for so many mouse model, right? So this, I was also asking myself, just one mouse model, simplify. But then the problem again started, if I just, talk about uh, a beta so i'm from like alzheimer disease like field but i like did my specialization in amyloid beta and i start arguing okay who is the first either amyloid beta is the first or the tau pathology is the first so again there was a controversy before but now it is very much clear that the alzheimer disease was uh, like a beta plaque or a beta was pathology was the first followed by uh, tau pathology but now the people working in the Alzheimer disease mouse, uh, Alzheimer disease, uh, particularly a beta, they will argue, okay, uh, these are these are the mouse model from like uh, like having problems, uh, having mutation in the APP responsible for producing more a beta plaques. Then the people from uh, tau pathology will say, okay, then what about tau? <laughs> so you know, then these people started making models uh, which are producing more tau as compared to more a beta. And again, it's not realistic then because uh, a beta plaque pathology will be, uh, after that, we will have this tau. So if there are more tau, then it's not really re realistic to the humans, right? So it's really, really complex to really understand this Alzheimer's disease. I, I hope that I'm trying to answer your questions. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, there's one more question that we have is, uh, how can we convince the diseased patient for taking the medicine uh, on a continued basis? Uh, you mean uh, the demented to continue, patient? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, so, to continue the therapy. I mean, as, uh, as the people are getting older, right? So uh, maybe they will be, uh, they are hard to deal with. Uh, so I can understand this question, but you know, uh, there are some, uh, so let's say if, if that person is having uh, Alzheimer's disease, then this person will likely to suffer dementia. So maybe this person itself uh, is not able to remember, uh, like he need to take medicine. So it's our job to do it, or it's a job of a caretaker who is like taking care of this person, but this demented patient or people having dementia will not at such remember anything. 
even he will not remember his face afterwards. So that's the problem with these patients. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's one more question that we have from Asha Mam is, uh, what are the recommended uh, in vitro models to test the efficacy of the drugs? Um, actually, I mean, there are not any it's like model as such, but rather what people are like we did in the lab was, uh, let's say like, as I said, the, the most affected cell in the brain is neuron. Okay, so we need to check the neurons by treating like a beta. So uh, we would say in, in our lab, what we used to do is that we used to have like primary microglia from the mouse, or you can also have SHS5 Y cells, like a, like a not real, uh, it's like a neural carcinoma cells, uh, mouse, uh, mouse, uh, mouse line, uh, the human cell line, but they are also not accurate. So I would rather focus on iPSC derived neuronal cells because they are more uh, relevant to the humans per se and treating those iPSC derived neurons with a beta. But again, which form of a beta is again another question because we have oligomers, we have monomers, we have fibrils. And again, we know that these oligomers are not stable. Monomers are also not stable. Fibrils are stable. But again, the fibrils are not uptaken by the microglia, but they are also dangerous to this neuron. But the most toxic ones are the mono oligomers. But as I said, the oligomers are in the transition phase. So we need to keep in mind the time period to treat these neurons, iPSC derived neurons should be shorter to make this treatment really by the A-beta oligomeric uh, one. So, uh, I mean, this is it. I mean, just treat the cells with the A-beta oligomers and then study uh, first, like what is happening to these neurons and maybe treating your like drug of interest, uh, maybe some resveratrol, for example, First, treat the neurons, iPSC derived neurons, treat with A-beta after two hours maybe, then treat with drug and then see if something is happening. But itself as such, there are no transgenic uh, cell line that uh, are, uh, are important for studying this uh, in in vitro. Uh, good afternoon, sir. This is yeah. Namrata here. Uh, my question is that uh, my grandfather has had having a Alzheimer but uh, the problem is this he didn't take the medicine in the proper time Malab, uh, she always he always said that uh, i don't want to take medicine he is taking medicine from the last 15 to 20 years now he has become a little bit frustrating so i will try to convince always try to convince him but uh, sometimes it's happened that he will not uh, said so i will said that uh, you have a dementia and you have also have alzheimer please take the medicine but he always said i don't want i don't want to take and having a dementia nowadays so okay this but is the then reason that why i want to convince him that they please take the medicine how would i convince him i that's why my question is this i mean anyway it's hard for everyone right to convince yes, yes. all elderly <laughs> yes, he is now elderly, 84, so... 85. Uh, but uh, he is so much a uh, little bit difficult like child would be able to convince but the elder people didn't able to convince to take the medicines <laughs> so please answer the question i mean look at the end i yeah so as i said i mean no matter what it's our at the end it's our responsibility right so because maybe he's not uh, willing to take it or maybe he's forgetting about it so it's literally in his not hands maybe if it is a confirmed dementia then surely he will not remember his face afterwards so it's uh, it's our job of a, our job or just job of a taker to make it really happen that he takes the medicine on time. Wow. One more question is this. Uh, yeah. my, actually, my, my brother is having epilepsy from the last uh, last year, well, uh, across 20 years before. But uh, he having taken the medicine of benzodiazepine nowadays. Mm. But when he didn't take the medicine, he he didn't able to sleep properly, and this happened. The medicine became a dependence, like. Mm -hmm. And when he didn't take the medicine, he are uh, having a little bit shivering and uh, memory uh, loss and on all. 
so how would i uh, he is the adult now he is not uh, too much old he is only 31 32 years uh, yeah. so but he has like said always i have taking the medicine little bit frustrating that also because of the medicines sometimes yeah. so he said how would i come to uh, forget these medicine well, how would i stop this medicine when i will stop this medicine so i said i will try to research him how would i how would the, the, the medicine going to stop uh, how this is my question is this now i mean uh, this kind of questions you know i suspect that i see look i am not uh, the doctor of your cousin or your relative yes, yes. Uh, yes, it's yes. better it's because you sp- speak with him because in this kind of case i don't know the severity or i don't know the complexity of uh, the Medicine. problem he is having ah, right yes, so yes, yes, yes. so uh, i have not diagnosed him personally or i have not checked him or i, I don't know anything about him Yes, so yes, yes. so like patient history like what he was doing before and then you know i think the most important thing is the patient history in all yes, yes. therapies right I, so I patient know. taking patient history and then checking mm-hmm. what he is doing at the moment uh, mm-hmm. maybe dose tapering i think you already know like so yes, it's yes, not yes. possible to like immediately stop the medicine but yes, tapering yes, the yes. dose so such kind of ap- approach has to be done by the clinic the clinical doctor in practice right so yes, uh, yes. maybe uh, it's better you speak with your doctor and then ask him like uh, uh, what yeah, his doctor is always is. saying that you have to take the medicine life long one medicine you have to take once diazepam you have to take the life long so he said uh, and how would i take the life life long and well, a little bit uh, sometimes become to convince him little bit difficult but i will try to him convince him but it happened to me and yeah. uh, i said that i will try to research some medicine and some time of herbal therapy that you will help you to stop these medicine you will take some herbal medicines and all so you can able to relieve from these medicines but you know in general also with my experience the brain itself is a very complex organ as we all know yeah. so always yeah. i would say like to take the opinion from another doctor this is i always recommend it's not a easy organ to study right so maybe if one interprets yes, yes. for example i know one case uh, where this patient mm-hmm. was having uh, was he some having some is- like ischemic attack yes. like he was having yes, a stroke yes. Uh, yes, yes. it was just on one side but then when i saw his prescription when i was in india i he was prescribed the the levodopa which is levodopa. mostly used in and that was also very high dose and this doctor yes. made a full plan of uh, you know the therapeutic strategy like okay this time this week or the he made a plan of it and then i asked like okay is it are you sure is it parkinson's because uh, is it a parkinson or is it a, it's a, it's just a mild stroke just check it out and look for the other option and then this p- p- person just went to the other doctor and then it was concluded that it was just the ischemia but he was saved from taking this levodopa so can you under, uh, can you imagine like it would have been a disaster you know if he just continued this high dose levodopa so it's 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 really like uh, uh, it's really complex to really like uh, 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 like conclude from anything that is related to brain yes. so uh, i just like suggest or tell even my friends also like to uh, really go and talk with another person there is nothing wrong in it so if okay. you have problems then just take an a second opinion why not like uh, then we know okay what is the issue right okay uh, yeah. one more question sorry <laughs> Yeah. actually uh, my my question is this ki uh, shall we ch- uh, always change the medicines after 5 to 6 years of the uh, neurodegenerative disease because uh, it uh, takes us the dependence and sometimes it's happened that uh, the dose is not going to affect in our body so is so, it necessary to change the dose or change the medicine dose like is it possible uh, for elderly people and for the young people too uh okay so if you just say neurodegeneration uh it's a very broad term so it includes parkinsons it includes alzheimers it includes other things okay so if i just talk about alzheimer disease i think there are no currently drug that is in the market except this couple of disease modifiers as i mentioned uh, uh the drug the, of course the dose dependency or drug dependency increases if you take for a chronic period but i would say again uh, you know that we like for example 
when i will know when i have alzheimers at the age at the maybe at the age of 70 so maybe at the age of 70 i start taking the, the this drug but i'm not taking this drug for whole of my lifetime right so it's just we need to look and ask the question to the doctor because maybe he is uh, going to plan this strategy or maybe taking opinion from other like doctor as well at the same time Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Uh, so we will take the next questions. Like uh, we can tell them to uh, mail you the questions because we are falling short of time. Yeah, sure. Uh, Write yes. me any any time. Yes, yes, I will be able yes. to answer. Uh, yeah. A request to all the participants: uh, any questions, any more questions? If you are having, you all can uh, mail it to sir. His mail ID is already mentioned here, so you can mail it to him in case you have any more queries. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, so thank you so much, sir, for such an informative session. In today's yeah. session, uh, you shared the information regarding the pathology, mechanism and disease progression for Alzheimer's disease. You also discussed the different uh, animal models for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you also explained about the various agents used in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you also highlighted the various uh, phytoconstituents uh, which have shown promising therapeutic potential for treatment of Alzheimer's disease. You also emphasized on the different therapeutic strategies that can be used in order to enhance the permeability of these agents across the blood-brain barrier. You also elaborated on how the agents are characterized and how the pharmacological activity is determined using different animal models. So thank you so much, sir, for such a wonderful session. Kindly accept this certificate as a token of appreciation. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Uh, I feel uh, honored and privileged to propose a vote of thanks for the session. On behalf of the Institute, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to our guest speaker, Dr. Pranav Joshi, sir. I extend my heartfelt gratitude to Honorable Dr. P.D. Patil, sir, Chairman, Deva Patil Unitic Society, Honorable Dr. Somnath Patil, sir, Secretary, Dr. Deva Patil Unitic Society, Respected Dr. Sohan Chitlangi, sir, CEO Administration, Dr. D. Y. Patel Unitic Society and Principal DPU Pharmacy, Pimpri Pune, and respected Dr. Santosh Pushpal, sir, Vice Principal DPU Pharmacy for their constant support and inspiration and providing all the necessary facilities to conduct this event. I am also thankful to respected Dr. V. Adipali, sir, Director Research and Professor, Department of Pharmacology for his constant motivation and guidance. I would also like to thank respected Dr. Asha Thomas, ma'am, Professor and HOD, Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry and Chief Coordinator of the event for her constant support and guidance. I would extend my generous thanks to all the delegates for their cooperation and patient listening. I would also like to thank the entire organizing team and technical committee for their untiring support and smooth conduct of the session. The schedule of the upcoming session would be posted on the WhatsApp group shortly. Participants are requested not to leave the group until the completion of the of all the IFTP sessions. I now request all the participants to switch on their videos for a group photo. Dr. Pranav, thank you very much. It was a great session and thank you for sharing all your expertise with us. Thank you very much. It is also, of course, my pleasure to talk to you and sure it's nice. It's nice, really like, <laughs> and also I am like really uh, happy that I'm back to my field, you know, like talking about pharmacy and drugs and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you very much, all of you for also attending this session. Yeah. Once again, thank you so much, sir. <laughs> okay, Dr. Prana, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.